Uh, yes. Yeah, so, what next, Queen of Stars? Uh, I've got a story for you. This one's kind of old, uh, but I think it's a really good one, and that you'll see echoes of the kind of issues that we as humans have with information. Um, you'll see echoes of this in probably what you saw from people on social media and COVID, what you might have seen from people around elections. Um, but it's one specific sort of example of how we're not always the most reasonable with information. Um, I do just want to flag as a brief content warning that I'm going to quickly mention abortion in the context of this case study, but it's not the main topic. Um, but if that is an issue for any of the listeners, um, maybe you can timestamp when we're finished or something like that. I'm putting that on future you. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not a big part of the study. All right, so this one is old, I guess 1995, back when you were not buying a house, silly, silly you. Uh, this story takes place in the United Kingdom. Um, and so there's a United Kingdom, or at least at the time, um, Committee on the Safety of Medicines. And so if you have people in your lives who take oral contraceptive pills, um, you may be aware already that these, like for a long time now, have an associated risk of blood clots. So current ones as well, this has kind of been a true feature of these. But by improving the, um, like the formulation of them or like tweaking different things, that's something that's being worked on. But it is just one of those things that's a risk with this particular medication, as any medication can have side effects. But there was this um, sort of, they called it like a doctor's note, I guess, that came out and it was sort of meant for public, like the public to be aware of. Um, and they announced that this third generation, this sort of third version of the pill that was what was most widely being prescribed and taken by people in the UK, um, it actually had double the risk of blood clots compared to what that previous version um, had. And they were only sort of seeing that now as they had more data on adverse events from this, but like that's a hundred percent increase. And so this came out and this was publicized um, quite, quite a lot in uh, the newspapers at the time. So I've got a couple snippets on screen. Oh, I'm sorry that I've got my alt text has kind of <laughs> shown up for people who can see it. Um, but basically, I've got a clipping from the Guardian newspaper, um, and the title was Blood Clot Alert on the Pill, and that women were being warned about seven brands of contraceptive that were under that third generation, and this doubled risk of blood clots. Um, and as you might imagine, this caused some concern uh, that people who, you know, had been taking this, might take this every day of their life, uh, we're now hearing this very scary uh, feature of the, this medication that they were on, and that was, you know, probably quite important to them. And so there were like health clinic lines that were full of callers. Like there was quite a lot of panic is basically the, what I'm trying to get to you um, at this point in the story. And so as I said at the beginning, we already sort of knew that oral contraceptives um, could cause blood clots, and that was a risk. And if you had a precondition that made you more likely to have them, it wasn't an option for you. And the other thing here was that part of that same message that I told you about at the beginning, where it says double the risk, 100% increase, it also in the same message said, for the vast majority of women, the pill is a safe and highly effective form of contraception. No one needs stop taking the pill before obtaining medical advice. So Alex, what do you think people did? Do you think they calmly waited for medical advice? Or do you think they did something else? I'm going to wager that they did something else. <laughs> yep. Yes. I think if you're a betting man, you're safe for this one. Um, the uh, use of this pill dropped like 80%. Wow. People just stopped taking it. They were freaked out. They did, like, didn't want to deal with the risk. They just stopped taking it. There was like a run on the pharmacies. People were trying to get the second generation one, which, you know, was the previous one that this new one has doubled the risk of. So let's go back to the safer one none of the chemists had anything left in them. Like it was, it was a real little bit of a public panic kind of moment. And now one really important thing to consider here is it wasn't just that people stopped taking the pill and that then meant there was fewer blood clots. Like, sure, if it was just that, fine. But there's kind of a reason that people take this medication in the first place. And there's lots of different reasons why different people might be taking it. But for quite a lot of people, it is for the purposes of contraception. So for people listening to the audio alone, I've got a graph on the screen. And the title is that there was 13,500 more abortions in the period after, or it's sort of the appropriate period after October 1995, and that sort of flow on effect. 
And so the graph on my screen shows that in general, the rate of abortions had been, in fact, not even just the rate, the absolute number of abortions in the UK had been decreasing, even as the population was probably increasing at the same time. So you were on trend where people had access to contraception that worked for them, arguably, and you were seeing fewer and fewer abortions. You saw them in this period after 1995 jump right back up to what they had been, you know, five years previously before that we were doing a good job of decreasing. And then, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. And then proceed to stay high for a few years afterwards as the information about the fear remained. But that message that was in that first part of like at the same time that it was announced where it's like, no one needs to stop taking this. It's fine. Talk to your doctor at your next checkup. Um, that part didn't really manage to, to be part of this persistent messaging. And I think one fact that was particularly like shocking to me, I guess, from this, or that really gave me sort of emotional connection to the story was that there was 800 additional conceptions among girls under 16. So folks who might've been relying on this in some way, not have a lot of access to other things and arguably may not have been intending pregnancy at that time. Um, and I found that quite a, a surprising number that this statistic and its influence on our emotions was a really powerful social disruptor for a little while there. This also just has dollar signs attached. So if you're like, I don't care, I don't need to take the pill, four to six million pounds more were spent by the National Health Service in that time, um, which is a, is a good chunk of change. So this to me is clearly something went wrong here. This wasn't the appropriate um, response from the public, although it probably could have been anticipated. I'm curious if I sort of stop at this point, what questions do you have? Like, what would you have wanted to know if you were receiving this in the media um, or if you had, you know, a person in your life who's trying to make a decision? Do you feel like you had all the information you needed to make a choice here? I think I'm interested in double the risk, right? Because double the risk sounds really alarming. And I think you can kind of understand the response from that perspective because that's a scary phrase. But I'm interested in the initial risk from the second generation before it gets doubled. Because if it's like the risk is like 0 0.01 and it doubles to 0 0.02, is that correct for doubling? Um, that, then that, is that, that significant? I don't know. I love that. Because yes, if only, if only Alex, folks had had you to ask at that time, because that is exactly the question you want folks asking themselves. And there's a whole other area of study that's outside of mine about like our risk tolerance and like when we think of different risks and things like that. But fundamentally, if you double a really small number, you still have a really small number. And so I'll, I'll show you just sort of briefly what this kind of looks like, I guess, as a picture. But basically, you've got two types of risk that you might have reported to you in the media. And this is a pretty common statistic. Um, maybe odds are more common if you're really into horse betting. But risk, like absolute risk, is just a straight probability. So your risk of getting hit by lightning is pretty low. Unless you're a New Zealand MP, it appears, in which we've had like three of them <laughs> hit by lightning. I do wonder, but absolute risk is just the chance of something happening. And so for the oral contraceptive pill, you could calculate that for yourself. And what the, what the people, the researchers had done was they looked at the total number of people who were taking that pill. And then they found out how many people had a blood clot. And that's just one number divided by another number. So I have on screen some terrible animations that I still love because I'm the one who drew them. And so let's say we have our 10 people who are taking an oral contraceptive pill. If three of them get blood clots, that's three out of 10 people. That's 30%. That's awful. That's a pretty high level of blood clots that I probably wouldn't, you know, I'd, I too would be jumping ship pretty quickly on a medication like that. But that's not what we really meant here. Because what does it mean to double the risk? This is something we call a relative risk because it's one number being compared to another. It's not that baseline or that initial risk that you were talking about, Alex. And you might hear this as like twice the risk or a twofold increase or any of this kind of language of doubling and increments. This is this relative risk idea. And so exactly as you were trying to think through for yourself, you're like, okay, 0 0.01, if I double that, that's only 0 0.02. Um, you can see that if you had an absolute risk of 30% and that doubled, that would be 
3%. Awful. Jump ship, absolutely. If you had a 3% risk, that's a 6% risk. I'm, I don't feel as invested in that difference in this case, personally at least, right? And that goes back to not just statistics, but your personal risk tolerance. But now if you're going from 0.3 to 0.6, I'm, I'm struggling to muster much of an emotional response at all to that difference. Like that doesn't feel like something that's going to overly motivate me to, to change, sorry, to change what I'm, I'm doing. I don't actually have the number directly in front of me, but the risk from the um, second generation oral contraceptives was much smaller than even what I have on screen. It was something like 0 0.1 in 1,000 or even smaller than that, I think. I'm sorry, I don't have it to hand. I can send it to you later if you want to put it somewhere. And so in the end, the doubling of that risk, while it may have some influences on a population level across millions and millions of people, personally, the risk of not taking a medication like this would far outweigh, or the risks associated with not taking the medication would far outweigh. And I think on a social level, the potentially negative consequences also far outweighed what um, the blood clots could have caused on a, both a societal level and on an individual level. And so exactly as you said, Alex, like freaking scary to have this headline about blood clots. Awful, awful. No, thank you. Um, but then if we don't know how to ask ourselves these questions, we can very easily trap ourselves in situations where we're just making decisions based on fear of things we don't need to be afraid of. There's enough things I'm afraid of on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. I don't need to like have fake new ones, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Wow. So I have a question for you, Alex. Do you do you eat bacon personally, or do you have a favorite food? Um, I I have bacon occasionally. Um, right. I don't know that I could come up with one single favorite food. <laughs> Let's eat bacon because I I have had a look at these numbers uh, once upon a time, okay. but like a more recent example is I don't know if you ever saw it, and by recent I think it's probably the last five years, um, is that bacon was listed as a carcinogen a cancer causing substance along with, mm. um, and you perhaps may be sorry to hear this in Germany, land of the lovely sausages, um, that any of those kind of cured meats or um, processed meats in some way um, increased people's risk specifically of bowel cancer. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe, and I'm sorry, I don't have this number in front of me, but it was something like a 14% increase in risk. And when I started looking at that, I was like, the people I know who really like bacon, that seems like not that bad an increase or anything like that. And then when I was taking a look at the numbers, especially in New Zealand, um, and especially I believe it was among older men, and oh, there's also variation by ethnicity, the baseline prevalence or sort of, if you were eating fairly healthy, just your general risk of getting bowel cancer is actually kind of high for some of our populations. And so while a 14% increase is nothing as scary sounding as a 100% increase, when I was looking at those numbers, and uh, if we're going to report bias, I am a vegetarian, so perhaps I don't have as much skin in this game. <laughs> um, but looking at that increase, to me, I was like, oh, that was actually enough to like tell my dad that I don't think he should eat as much bacon. Because even though it was a smaller relative increase, because it was still of a kind of high level of just prevalence of a people just get quite a lot of bowel cancer in New Zealand. It's a real mm -hmm. medical problem for us. Um, that actually had me kind of worried. So. I think it's a total overreaction to stop your pill for a 100% increase, but I don't think it's that bad an overreaction to limit your bacon intake, intake for a 14% increase. So that relative and that absolute, it really matters that you have the full picture there. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to ask about another example just to elaborate on that point. Um, like this is a news example, so maybe you might not have the exact things or I don't have the exact numbers either, but I remember during COVID, there was a lot of justification by certain governments being like, oh, it's only a 3% of the population is affected by this or is dying or some, something like that, right? Like they were saying like it's only 2% or 3% of the population will probably die by this or whatever. But then you kind of extrapolate it to the pure numbers and you're saying, so you're talking about, what's it? If you have 100 million people in a country, 3%, you're talking about 3 million people dying here. Are you okay with this? All of a sudden, these small percentages actually mean quite large numbers. I think that's um, such an important human example. If the question is, okay, I am sort of discounting small percentages in some cases, but in the COVID example, you're like, oh, it's only 3% of the population. But then when you're starting to think of, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people globally, 
I think it gets to this really important interface between humans and numbers. Because a small change, like a change between 0.3 and 0.6 that I was talking about earlier as not being particularly meaningful to me, in some contexts, that would actually be super important. And it's one of those things where for some stories, it would be a rounding error. But for other contexts, that could be the difference between a business going bankrupt or you know growing and profiting. It could be the difference between a global pandemic and uh, oh, thank goodness we had that contained and nothing happened. And I think just as your sort of question earlier about sample sizes, like what's the threshold? What's the threshold? All of this is so context dependent that you need to know. And one thing I really cherish as a statistician is working with subject matter experts in the applied disciplines that I'm working on. Now, I have been talking to this wonderful woman doing research on tuna and how people interact with and use tuna in Kitabas. And I know nothing about any of those things, but I know a little bit about survey design. And so having conversations with a subject area expert helps you tease out what actually matters to measure and how. And that's the same with interpreting these numbers. And I guess the only guide I'd have for folks there is the same sort of media literacy you'd apply to influencers on social media, to political claims, even if they don't involve numbers. The key question to ask yourself as a person who has to navigate this information saturated world is what is the person who's telling me this? What do they want me to think? And why might it be important to look farther than that? And numbers are just one of those tools that we have to influence people. And as Alex was saying earlier, for those of us who might fall into the bog of sort of overconfidence, where we think a statistic can be used and wielded basically as a cudgel against the non-believers, um, we want to be really careful of like, why are we using that number in that way? Are we trying to present it as the small percentage because we know our reader or our listener would be horrified by the actual numbers? No easy answer. We just got to use our brains as smooth as they may be. <laughs> that was nice. <laughs>